Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And once again, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. And I've been getting a lot of good feedback on last week's episode. This is part two of our conversation with Craig Newby and Dave Rosevald. And there's been a lot of people talking about how sales reps can give their customers more value. So it's going to be really cool getting to jump into the second half of that. Before we do, though, I want to just speak again to the COVID-19 crisis that's going on. So far, I mean, this podcast season has just been dominated by this and man we we still don't know ultimately how things are going to play out what's been really interesting to see is how companies are responding to it on the firetime network for the last couple weeks we've been hosting a speakeasy once a week where people can get together they can talk about basically what they're doing to keep the doors open for their business a lot of people are talking about the sba loans that are out there cash flow situations and there's been some amazing conversations and i think at the end of it what i'm realizing is that it's going to be community that gets us through this it's really easy to feel like you're alone and when there is a crisis going on man uh it's easy to isolate yourself and i think that what's cool about this situation compared to other economic downturns that we've had is that technology has made things available that weren't to connect us. And we're just seeing that as something really special. Everybody I talk to is in a million Zoom meetings all the time. And, you know, it's funny that like it just our time wasn't occupied like that before. But I think that there is something really special. I know for me, connecting with groups in the Firetime Network through our speakeasies, connecting with other just family members and friends through Zoom, through FaceTime and through Teams has been awesome. And I want everybody out there, man, just stay strong. This is something that we're going to get through together. We haven't seen anything like this before and we are in the middle of being disrupted and whenever there's disruption, there's always opportunity. It doesn't mean that it's not a terrible situation and we need to do everything we can to protect our loved ones and our friends and community members. But I do think on the tail end of this, there are some things that we can be taking advantage of to rethink the way that our business is operated because I do believe that this is going to change things and we can take advantage of that. So with that, I do want to plug the Firetime Network for anybody that hasn't joined or heard of it yet. The Firetime Network is a social media platform that we started about a month ago. Grant Falcom and I wanted to create something to bring our industry together. We've been working on it for about nine months and the timing couldn't have been better. And it's just been crazy to see all these dealers and manufacturers and distributors from across the country coming together to find common ground to share best practices. And our hope when we started this thing is that we would have companies that say are at stage three of their business. They can help people at stage two. They can look ahead to people that are at stage four. And ultimately, this can be a petri dish of where we share the best practices and we basically have the resources to go to get better. So if you haven't joined it yet, you need to go to the firetimenetwork.com and sign up. It's totally free to join. The cost of entry is that you have to fill out a survey with the state of our expo and our industry. And after that, you'll be given the information to join the group. What's been cool with this too is that we've been hosting webinars and the content has just been awesome. I hosted one the other week on building a digital sales plan where we talk about like, If your showroom is closed down, what can you do tomorrow to shift your model so that you can be relevant with your entire team working from home and not interacting with customers? So we have all kinds of content like that. Like I mentioned before, we're hosting digital happy hours. Those have been just absolutely terrific. And more than anything, we are seeing a community being formed where people that have never met that are across the country are now being able to message each other, share best practices, and just let each other know that, man, they're in this together. I was on a call the other day and somebody mentioned that we're all in different boats in the same storm. And what's been cool about the Firetime Network is it has just been an awesome reminder of the fact that we're here together and we're going to get through this. 
So with that in mind, before we get to the conversation, I want to mention one thing. So I talked a few episodes ago about a speaking tour that I was going to be going on through New England. And obviously, in light of COVID-19, that is not going to be happening as of right now. But the Northeast HPBA put something together that is awesome for their members. So if you were planning on going to any of my speaking dates in the New England. Basically, what we're doing is a series of webinars that's going to cover the same material. So we're going to run three webinars. The first one's going to be about building a digital sales plan for your company. The second one is going to be about sales leadership, how to track and follow up on your opportunities. And basically, this is about how to supercharge the effectiveness of your sales team and manage them in a way that sets them and your business up for success. The third webinar is going to be called putting it into practice. And it's going to be a live workshop where I actually work with all of these businesses one-on-one. I mean, it's one-on-one as you can get through a webinar where we are going to build this out for your specific business. So this is going to be free for all Northeast HPBA members. And the webinars are going to be on Tuesday, April 14th, Tuesday, April 21st, and Tuesday, April 28th at 11 a.m., Eastern. So if you want to take advantage of that, make sure to go to nehpba.org. That's nehpba.org. So with that in mind, I'm going to get out of the way and we are going to finish up this conversation with Craig Newby and David Rosebold. Now, Tim, you're a, a large retailer, multiple locations. Yeah. Um, what a, what a, when a sales rep's calling on Fireside, how how is that different than when a when a sales rep is calling on the small mom and pop where it's only you know they're a company of less than ten people you know maybe only five people how how in your experience have you seen where how the the sales rep has to navigate either a very large customer or potentially a smaller customer yeah it's a really good question I think that it comes back to understand your customer. I say that with every single answer. Understand your customer. Every customer is different. And there are a lot of similarities between big companies and small companies, but there are some nuances. I think that as a big company with multiple stores, we don't just make a decision and bring on a product line. Like the owner of our company could say, we're going to bring this on. Good luck. It, it, it'll it'll take him six months, even as the owner of the company, because there's a process that you got to go through. Same thing for me. Like I run a retail division, but there's a process. And in our company, you know, it's it's got to be you know green lighted by someone in the company. They need to talk to the purchasing team. They need to talk to the installation team. It needs to get in front of the leadership team. And at some point, we have to make a collective decision on is this a good move or not. And on top of that they have to understand the way that we do business. So like for us, we're not buying anything as an early buy. We're not doing it. You know, you have to come to us and say, we're going to be, and this is where distribution comes into play, man. Like you guys are the early buy, right? You've got this stuff in stock. You can fulfill. So there's, but I'm not joking. A rep has never come to me and said, Tim, we understand that you don't keep heavy stock on these products. We would like to be the bank. We would like to stock this for you and deliver it on this regular basis so that you always have it in time for your products and you never have to do an early buy again. It's never happened. But yet that is of immense value to me. We're coming in and and saying, well, I'll get you these terms if you do an early buy. I don't care about the terms. I don't care about it. Like what I care, and and, and I'm I'm not down on early buys because there are a lot of businesses that need that and you can make a lot of extra money on that. So I am not saying early buys are not right. I'm just saying for our company, it's just not the way that we do business. So, so understanding what, what is the path to getting this product line through the fireside funnel? What is the style that they buy? Do they do early buys? Do they not? Even if they don't do early buys, do they like to have anything in their barn? You know, what's the, the, these are really important questions to understand. And for fireside, frankly, like it can take a company, you know, a year, a year and a half to actually get the product in from the time they first talked to us. And frankly, most reps don't have the patience for it because right. they're looking to sell a PO. They're not looking to create a relationship that ends up being a long-term win-win five years down the road. So that's really important. Now, for the, for the smaller retailer, well, I'll go back. Another thing with this, if you're, if you're working with a big company, obviously it's going to take time, but the, the payoff could be a lot higher. 
but they probably need to see this through at every stage. So if you've got a relationship with the sales manager, great. Do you know the purchaser? Do you know who's on the leadership team in the company? Do you know who the lead installer is to get in front of them? Most of the time, a rep only has a relationship with one person and they make no effort to understand the organizational chart of the company. That's really important in a large organization, right? I mean, if, if I'm going to go sell to AES and I've got a great relationship with the driver who delivers to me every week, amazing. Leverage that. But to think that I can get a product into AES because I have a relationship with the driver is foolishness, right? I got to understand the org chart, right? Who's the purchaser? How do the sales reps work? How do they buy? When do they buy? What quantities do they buy? Who's the decision maker? Are there multiple decision makers? Have I gotten together with Craig? Have I gotten together with Kirk, right? These are really important questions that we have to understand as a sales rep to, to sell to a big company. Now, for a small company, there are some things that are different to where the purchaser might also be the head installer, might also be the sales manager. And there's no shame in a big or small company. Like, frankly, man, you know, big companies are, are the Navy, Small companies are the pirates. Dude, when you're a pirate, you can move so fast. You can disrupt the Navy like crazy. I mean, everybody knows this. So, like, I am not down on small companies. Like, there is immense power in that as long as you understand that you're the pirates, right? When you, when, when you are the pirates and you think that you're the Navy, it just means that you're slow and you don't change. But, man, when you realize, dude, we're the pirates, we have advantages to exploit that the Navy will never have. Use it, right? I, I say that because... It's both companies have value, but I think that in a small company, you got to understand again, the customer who's a decision maker and what's important to them, right? So do they do early buys, right? Maybe a small company does early buys because they want to have a price advantage against the big guy, man, use that to your advantage. You know, if you're selling to a small person and there happens to be a giant company in their marketplace, do some shopping, find out what they sell stuff for. Go to the small company and say, look, I know that margins are tight, but we have an early buy program. And I'm telling you, man, you're going to save 7% or 5% or 10%, whatever it is. This is going to give you the pricing advantage to compete with the Navy. This is how you do it. So I think it comes down to understanding the customer and putting together a value proposition that solves their problems. I think everything comes down to that. You... You do a really good job uh, reaching out and touching uh, other retailers. Um, Thank you. I, your, your name comes up all the time. When I was just in Sacramento doing this launch of this new product line. There's a huge dealer, uh, multi-store uh, dealer in California. And uh, because you had talked to them before we did, did this meeting, you already pre-sold the product for it. For no me. way. I promise. I'm Get not, not going to mention the name, but I, you'll know who it is off air when I tell you. But So... I would encourage other dealers, you know, don't call your direct competitor, of course. They're not going to tell you anything, but gosh, you know, schedule some times like you do. Uh, Grant does at Falco's. Yeah. Um, to pick up the phone and call and talk to other retailers and find out what's working for them, how's it going. Yeah. I do this with David all the time. My brother and I are in constant communication with David. He's across the border. He carries a lot of the same things. Um, I pick up good ideas from David. So I'm. the point of this is just encouraging you dealers out there listening to this, you know, and many are doing it, but yeah. more could be doing it, and, you know, just to get better. Yeah, and, and frankly, that's been the heart behind this podcast is like, how do we share what the best practices are versus like hoard everything for ourselves, you know? Um, I keep thinking, I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. I keep thinking about that line from A New Hope where uh, Princess Leia says to Grandma Moff Tarkin, the more you tighten your grip, the more systems will slip through your fingers. And dude, that's the truth with business, man. Like to have an abundance mentality is I mean, that's the way that you win. When you have a mentality of scarcity and cynicism, dude, stuff slips through the cracks. You start, to, you start to make decisions in a way to protect yourself versus trying to grow. Like Peter Drucker talks about the way that you win in business is not to solve problems. It's to exploit opportunities. And I think that that abundance mentality is huge. And, and Craig, to your point, over the last few years, man, like the most valuable relationships I have are with other people in the industry. And frankly, like some of them I compete with, but they're still friends. And like, man, we don't talk about price fixing or anything like that. But like, you know, we talk about like, what are the best things we can do to serve our customers, man? Like there is so much value in that. And that's been the cool thing about the podcast. I appreciate you saying that about the, the person in Sacramento. The hope is that this starts to do that globally, that, that we can actually start to listen and think like, 
yeah, the guy down the street sells gas inserts too. And here's what he does well and here's what he could get better at. But you know what? There's a million customers in my neighborhood that don't even know what a gas insert is. So why do I care what the guy down the street's doing? I think it's just important that we get more people educated on what a gas insert is and how it can help them. You know, I I, I found immense value in that, that, that there's, there's men and women all over North America that are starting to think that way. And and they probably have been thinking that way before, but it's, it's been cool how the podcast has started to, to connect some of those relationships. And I know for me, it's made me feel like I'm not alone. And, and hopefully it does that for other people too. How often are you, you know, are you looking to be contacted by, by your, your sales rep? Do you, do you have, you know, like, do you have a, a rule of thumb or anything that you say, you know, what's, what's, too much contact what's not enough contact where where do you kind of where where do you you know put that in the importance for you as a as a retailer i think it comes back to understanding who the customer is it's going to be different for everybody um and it depends on the value that the sales rep brings like i'd say frankly i wish that most sales reps contacted me less i wish i had less meetings i really do uh the sales reps that are truly truly good there's not many of them. I'm not going to give a number because I don't want to offend anybody, but there's not many of them. Um, you know, they could, they could call me a little bit more because I look at them almost as a consultant to help me grow my business. And like, man, how much free time with a consultant would I take advantage of? A lot. Yeah. I take advantage of a lot of it. But it comes down to what you do. And, and we, haven't, we haven't turned here yet, and maybe the conversation will go here. I don't know what questions you have, but when I think about the high-value activities that a rep can deliver, it really is – teaching my team to sell better. That is that is the most important thing a rep can do in the highest value. So like if I have a rep that comes to me and says, "Tim, I know how busy you are and I know how important it is that your team stays sharp. I would like to make a commitment to you every 6 weeks to come in for an hour and a half, you name the time, and for an hour and a half we will do live sales practice with your team. And I'll run it. You can, you can be here if you want. You can stay at home. But I will run live sales practice every six weeks. Would that be okay? I mean, I'm going to be like, yes, please. Like, oh, yes, please. And guess what? If they cancel an appointment, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it. Because I, if we get into the groove of this, where like, and my team gets in the groove of it, yeah, every six weeks, you know, this rep comes in. And, man, I hate it. Like, I have to get in front of everybody. I mean, Craig, you've done this with us. You've seen us do live practice. And... It is, it is so valuable to me that I will miss it when it's not there. This is a question that every sales rep should ask. And frankly, it's a question that, that I should ask too with what I'm doing on, on the podcast. I, I think about this a lot. If the podcast went away, would anybody miss it? Sure. As a sales rep, if I went away, would the dealer ever miss me? I have to say yes. And I'm just, just going to say for my salespeople out there that <laughs> listen to this, by us asking questions, look how much you've exposed. I mean, look how much I've learned if I was going to be calling on you. Um, so I would say, yeah, you'd be missed. I mean, you have such great insight and you're, you're interviewing very wise people that have been in the industry forever and knowledgeable. So I can honestly, for me, yes. I hope so. That, but that's, that's the question that I ask. Yeah. Because if, if the podcast gets to a point, I've thought about this, like, how long is the podcast going to go? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it's going to be forever. I mean, I might get hit by a bus or I don't know. But I know for a fact, the day that I feel like the content has shifted to where this will not be missed, that's the day I got to hang it up. And, 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 and I know for me, that's just a question I think about a lot. And I think that sales reps need to Think about that as well, right? Yeah, that's a good if, point. If I, if I never saw this rep again, would they ever miss me? And frankly, with most reps, the answer is no. It really is. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this further. This is something I think about a lot with our own lives, right? I think it's really important as rich Western Europeans in the most privileged society that has ever existed that hoards almost all of the wealth globally, we have an immense responsibility to be generous, immense. And, and one of the questions, and dude, this is like an indictment on myself. I think about a lot is like, I got to be generous to people in general in my life. If I get hit by a bus and my generosity stopped, would anybody miss it? You got to think about that with your life in general. 
We'll get back to our conversation with Craig Newby and David Rosevold in just one second. Hey, if you're in business today, you know that COVID-19 is running rampant and everybody has been seriously disrupted. So one thing that's been absolutely critical is to rethink your business to be able to work from a digital selling perspective. And a couple of weeks ago, I ran a webinar through the Firetime Network where we talked about if you're a brick and mortar business, how can you shift that model to make yourself relevant in the digital space if your showroom is closed or inhibited from working with customers in the way that you normally do? And basically what we talked about is building a new sales funnel. It's a three-part sales funnel where stage one at the very top is engaging customers via chat. Stage two is providing instant estimate ranges for their products. And stage three is scheduling a digital consultation to close the deal. Now, this is something that you can do totally free of charge. There's some amazing services that you can use on your website to engage via chat. You can train your team members up to try to provide quick estimates. And you can use Zoom and FaceTime and other things like that to schedule a digital consultation with customers to close the deal. But if you're looking around and thinking, I need a better way to do this, I want to tell you about Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is a software program that we've been working on for the last few years. And basically, the goal is to supercharge everything we've been talking about in the digital space, where Wi-Fi will partner with your website to generate customized estimates for your clients, no matter what their situation is. It uses automated follow-up to nurture customers all the way through the sales funnel. And lastly, it makes sure that nothing slips through the cracks. And especially as team members are being pulled in different directions, it is really easy to let opportunities slip by. So if you're sitting here thinking, you know, I know I have to do something to stay relevant in the digital space, and I don't know what it is. I encourage you to check out wifire.com. That's W H Y F I R E. Dot com. And we're actually doing something crazy. We have some special pricing available in light of the COVID crisis. And I'm actually not even going to announce it on the podcast, but I'm just going to tell you that if you sign up, we have significantly lowered our price temporarily to help you maximize your cash flow during the COVID crisis. And it is imperative that your business is relevant in the digital space. We do not want money to be an obstacle that prevents you from that. And so in light of that, we have significantly lowered Wi-Fi's prices temporarily to help you through this crisis. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, but do not hesitate to go to wifire.com and sign up. You know, I had a call yesterday from from a dealer, and and maybe this is maybe this is a sign when your when your sales reps are you know achieving or adding adding value. And and the dealer's comment was, "When's he going to be back from vacation?" No way. I need to talk to him. And uh-huh. and to me, it was just kind of like I was like, "Okay, there's 15 other people in the company that you can talk to. Yeah, there's you know we can answer the questions." And he's like, so when's he back? Yeah. And, and to me, that was, that was kind of a, a sign that are we meeting the needs of a dealer? Clearly that person is. When, when it's like, no, we, we can answer the question too, but no, they specifically said, when is this, when's the rep going to, going to be back? Because I need to talk to him. And I was like, so do you actually miss him? And the dealer was, yes. Wow. Gonna, and that was a, a good feeling to know that yes. our rep has connected with the dealer and the dealer feels that he's adding value. You know, maybe bad that the dealer didn't want any of us to answer the question, but it was just, it was a, a feel good moment for us and how our, our sales reps are, are engaging with their customers. Well, I'll tell you for me that in, in my time in the industry, I'm, I'm coming up on my 15th year in the industry and the people that made the biggest impression on me were sales reps. And there's a few, and I'm going to drop names here and I'm sorry if I leave somebody out, but like when I think back to who has formed Tim Reed, Kip Rimmons and Ed Hozak from Travis. For sure. Absolutely. I think about Art Ratcliffe, Deb Hannig, think about Troy Olson. There might be others I'm missing. I, Tim Rethlake has formed me a ton. I wouldn't consider him a sales rep, though. I, I think that these other people, these are sales reps that were calling on us. They were with me in my formative years, and they taught me how to sell. They taught me how to think. They taught me how to interact with customers. And I cannot tell you how valuable that was for me. And 
these are relationships now where I look at these people with like gratitude of like, man, I, I want to help you out because what have you, you've invested so much in me. How can I help you? Like I look at AES this way, you know, I want to give as many dollars as we can to AES because you have been so inspirational and transformational in my journey in the hearth industry. Now that doesn't mean we're always going to do business together and there might be times where I make a decision to go elsewhere, but that is where my loyalty lies because the investment that's, that has been instilled in me. Thank you. Thank you. So would you say, you know, is that about, is that about the relationship? Or is that about the the products? Or where do you see the correlation between relationship and product? When you think of your you, with think of AES, has it been the relationship first, then product, or product then relationship? What has formed that you know that feeling of of allegiance for you? I think it's really intertwined, and it's probably going to be different from rep to rep, but. I think about where I was 11 years ago. I'd been an installer for four years, not a very good one. (laughs) And my father-in-law had shown me immense grace and immense patience. And I just left the small town of Corvallis and moved up to Portland, Oregon. And I had a job at a big Travis dealer there. And I'd known Kip for four years at this point. He's a great guy. And we didn't have a super close relationship, but, but, but we would talk and we, 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 I would say we had like a, a strong acquaintance relationship, but I got into a sales role and him and I met, I met Ed Hozak at the time too. When they came in, they would spend a little bit of time with my boss in his office and the rest of the time they were on the floor with me working on the products. They would be going through, this is how this product works. These are the opportunities of, of how you need to talk about these features. This is what you need to be listening for. Okay, you know, I'm going to be the husband. Ed's going to be the wife. We're going to come in and, and you're going to sell to us. We're going to talk about it. It was so valuable to me. And, and I would say that you can actually do that without a relationship. I think the relationship blossoms from that. But I think that they were probably intertwined. And because when you think of those relationships... Does that then, if someone like an Ed or a, a Debbie or an Art came into you now, does that put them ahead yes. of the next rep that oh, yes. walks in? Absolutely. Yes. Um, because they have given me value, and I'll take this further, they've given my team value. The most valuable thing that any sales rep can do for any company, big or small, is help the salespeople sell more. That is the most important thing. And they need to forget about the fact that they sell whatever lines they sell. They need to help the salespeople sell more. Because if as a dealer I sell more, I will buy more of your products. I just will. And most reps are afraid to teach my team how to sell because they actually don't know how to sell my products. We have sales reps that decide not to come and see us because they don't want to engage in live practice. Craig, we've gone through this before with Louis Falco, where a couple years ago, Louis came and you came, and we ran sales practice for like an hour and a half. And it's intimidating. It is. Everybody's scared of it. It really is. And for me, like, dude, I crash and burn all the time in live sales practice. It happens, right? But you get better at it. You get better at it and better at it. And the whole thing is that practice doesn't make perfect, but it makes permanent. So if I'm if I'm practicing and getting feedback from a sales rep on, hey, I noticed that you did this, our products actually have a great advantage that you need to talk about right here instead of going to this default that everybody else has man, that is valuable. And if that's practiced on repeat, that's going to help. So thinking about what is it that's going to give value and and does that buy me credibility with the decision maker? Man, absolutely. Like if I have reps that help my team sell more, and this could be live sales practice. This could be teaching my team how to use price sheets. This could be teaching my team how to write a proposal. This could be teaching my team how to look up Whatever product that common customers are looking for, this could be training a new hire. Man, that helps me sell more. And for the reps that do that, you bet they're going to get the time of day from me. One of the things I think about a lot as a retailer 
and this is just kind of the philosophy that I've had, is we have a million options. And the job of a rep, and actually the job of me as a, as a leader in our company is to help my team focus. We don't need more options. We need to focus down what we have. And if a rep can come in and help my team stay focused on the things that matter, stay directed in the conversation, it's going to be so powerful. And one of the biggest missed opportunities is on the retail sales floor, most companies have an extremely low quote rate. If, if you actually track it, if you track the customers that come into the showroom versus the amount that leave with an estimate in their hand, and it doesn't have to be a hard quote, even just an estimate range, it's very, very, very low, extremely low. I would say for most companies, it's under 20%. Of, of the people that you're marketing dollars that you've paid to walk into the showroom, I would say eight out of 10 absolutely walk out without an estimate. We've, we've tracked this personally. So we track our door swings and what we do is we track the difference between a customer that's looking at gasket supplies or they're doing a will call pickup or whatever versus what we call a true retail customer. So, we consider a true retail customer is going to be someone who comes in looking at a gas insert or a stove or a fireplace or a high dollar product that we sell. They're a true retail customer. And that's where we track our quote percentage, right? With the other customers, they're absolutely important. But if you come in looking for a gasket on their wood stove, they don't need to get a written estimate on, you know, right. a built in gas fireplace, right? right? So we track our quote rate on true retail customers. I highly encourage every business to do this. What we found, and I, and I feel like our team does a pretty good job, man. Like I, I think they're really, really good. But about two years ago when we started doing this, my guess, like we set a benchmark of our goal was that 80% of the true retail customers would walk out with an estimate. And frankly, like it should be 100%, but like we, we chose 80. We found that we were actually right at about 20 wow. when we started tracking it. Over the last two years, that has changed where we are above 80% now. So you think about this. If a sales rep can come in with a way to even count your door swings and teach a business leader or an owner or a secretary at the front desk how to do that, is that valuable to me to know my traffic? To you know, Man, it's super valuable. But, but you think about this. If only 20% of customers, I know we're using ballpark numbers, but I'm just talking about our, about our experience, if only 20% of the customers walking in to look at a gas insert walked out with an estimate, so 8 out of 10 left the store, they were looking at a gas insert and they walked out with a brochure and a business card. If, if only 20% walked out with an estimate, how much more would we sell if we could raise that? A ton. Because more estimates equals more sales, period. And I think that one of the highest value activities a rep can do besides live sales practice is simple pricing tools, even like building a quote system. And you can build it in Excel. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. But, but you know, as a sales rep, if you sell a product line that's got a million options, pick your best sellers. You know, for our gas inserts, here's the best seller. Here's what's included in the package. You've got a line item to add your labor. You've got a line item to add your gas line, your electrical, your framing, whatever. But an easy way for a new sales rep to give a customer an estimate because a lot of new sales reps are intimidated Many sales reps, when they're on the floor, don't ask the right questions of customers because they're busy. They've heard it a million times. They're a week behind on their estimates. They got a huge stack of them on the counter, and their focus is not on the customer because they have, quote, important work to do when they get back to the desk. That's not right. But as a sales rep, if you have a way to quote customers that is easy for a dealer to take advantage of, which company do you think the reps are going to quote? Dude, it's a no-brainer. Like, if I got to look for a, through a manufacturer's price book and feel like I'm deciphering biblical Greek to look at this part number, AX3-257-152, okay, that's the surround. Now I need I need the starter caller, which is an 83625-A. Oh, wait, no, I need the dash B. Um, okay, now I need the, the, the vent pipe kit, which is a 45DEG-TX7. Okay, wait, I'm going to need 245s. Like, oh my gosh, like, that is difficult. If you can give me an easy way for my team to price stuff, holy cow, they're going to do it. Right. Those are high value activities. Yeah, here.
Tim, if you were to to kind of sit back and and you know look up to the stars, what would be your you know your definition of the perfect sales rep? What what is if you could if you were able to make one from the ground up? Who what who or what is that perfect sales rep for Tim? Someone who understands my business and the problems that I have and comes to me with solutions to solve them. It's really simple. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. Um, most sales reps don't. Most sales reps don't understand our business. They think they do, but they don't. I was talking to Grant Falco before this conversation because I think this conversation is so important. And he said the same thing. I said, Grant, if there's anything that you would like to, to have said on this podcast, what would it be? And he said, I want people to understand my business. And no one does. They don't do the research to understand our problems. They don't do the research to have any idea what is important to me. They shove something in my face and expect me to do something about it. And man, it just comes down to like your products are medicine for dealers. But if you just start shoving medicine in my face without me having that problem, like I'm not going to take it. I'm actually going to be really offended by you. But if I have a problem and your medicine solves it and you come to me, show that you understand the problem and then present me the medicine, holy cow, like we're going to start doing some business together. And if I like you, oh my gosh, like we're going to start doing even more business together. I think a lot about Bradley Hartman and I'm going to butcher this story because he he tells it so much better, but he used to be a purchasing manager for Pulte Homes and I think he was based in Chicago and he purchased for a, a bunch of different major markets. So people are coming to him 24 hours a day trying to sell him stuff. His, you know, his, his entire day is spent deleting voicemails and deleting emails and trying to fend off sales reps to get his work done. But that's, you know, when you're in a purchasing role, that's what you do. And, and he talks about there's, there's such a difference between the sales rep that comes in and says, hey, David, hey, Craig, I am selling sheetrock and guess what? I've got the best prices around and my sheetrock is, it's going to give you this, this, and this, and it's so dirt cheap and it's this, that, and the other. And Bradley tunes out because he's like, dude, everybody's sheetrock does. Everyone's telling me there's this better. Everyone tells me they've been in business for 30 years. Everyone tells me they got the cheapest price. Like, it doesn't matter. Versus a sales rep that comes in and says, Bradley, I know your time is extremely valuable. We've got 22 minutes before the next meeting. And I'd love to share with you what I've learned about your business. So I've actually visited your subdivisions in Cherry Hill Drive, Glen Ridge, and Oak Hills. And as I walked your job sites and talked to your superintendents, I noticed that you have a lot of leftover sheetrock on your projects, but the way that it's being stored is breaking it and you can't return it. I'm guessing that your overage is 20% based on what superintendent John Brown told me. What we offer with our sheetrock packages is a way to store it so it doesn't get damaged when there's overages. And we actually come by your job sites for you to bring those parts back and return them so that A, nothing is stolen, and B, you get all your money back. I think that we can save you 20% in your overages. Is Bradley going to listen to that? Oh my gosh, right? I mean, because for him, he's wasting this material. Now, as a purchasing agent, think about this, right? For you guys in distribution, if you've got a product that is not shipped very well and because of it, you end up having 20% that's damaged and has to be thrown away. If another vendor can come in and say, hey, I've noticed as I've talked to your sales reps and walked your warehouses that this product is, shows up damaged and you're having to throw it out. I've got something that ships to where it's never going to be damaged and you can sell every single one of them. Oh my gosh, Like you guys are going to listen to that, aren't you? Right? Like it's, it's saving you money. And I think that it's really important that a sales rep understands the problems of, of their dealer. I, I keep saying that again and again and again. And and frankly, many sales reps will listen to this and, and they might default to thinking, well, okay, next time I get a meeting, I'm just going to sit down and say, okay, David, hey, tell me about your problems. Just talk to me. David, do you have time to do that? If I'm like a stranger, are you going to tell me the intimate details of the problems of your business? Absolutely not. No, no way. So you got to do some research first, right? But if I can come to you and, and start pushing on this pain point that you have and show that I understand it, all of a sudden we're going to have a conversation. So I think that that's a really important distinction is, is the answer is not 
just ask a bunch of questions. I mean, you, you should ask questions, but you actually have to do research first. Right. And you have to figure out, have you earned the right to a meeting? And if you don't know your customer, cancel the meeting. It's, it's a waste of time. It, it really, and, it, and it's going to turn them off to you and make them think that you're an idiot. But if you've done the research and you're ready for the meeting, then you take advantage and you exploit it. And what that probably means is that sales reps need to pick their best opportunities as opposed to a shotgun. So when they, when they do their forecasting, they got to think about, man, who, who are the opportunities that we can do the best on and what's the likelihood that they're going to buy, right? So you, you got to balance your, your prospects like that. But most sales reps don't think about their prospects that way. And every time they come in, it's a fresh conversation versus picking up where they left off. It's, it's very, very, very rare that a sales rep has follow-up skills. And, and I, I don't say this to dog sales reps. I think that most sales reps have very good hearts. The problem is they're not being trained this way. And it's the same thing with, with retail folks. Man, like I feel so bad for retail people on the floor because that was me you know, 10, 11 years ago, like, dude, I didn't have a clue. Like, I'm just a kid trying to like pay my bills and play guitar in this rock band. So I got this job that I don't think I'm going to be in for forever, but like, I, I like it for now. And that was my life. So like, I didn't know a lot of things. And, and I just think that it is, there's no ill will here, but the choice that we have is if we understand that like right now we're not delivering value like this, what are we going to do to make it better? What are we going to do to get the training that we need to start thinking this way? One of the best things, man, if you got a rep that you're close with and you sell to dealers in non-competitive areas and you call up that customer and say, hey, I'm trying to get into the Seattle market. I know that you've got this buddy. What do I need to know about him to help me? What do I need to know about her to help me solve their problems? Man, like if I believe that you actually can solve their problems, I'm going to tell you. Bradley Hartman calls this the RRI method, and he says it's the guaranteed way a sales rep will get a phone call back, and it's referral, research, insight. Referral, research, insight. So if I want to come in and sell to you, David, if I have a referral, is there a better chance I'm going to get to you? Uh, Definitely. Okay. Okay. If I've done research on the problems that your business has, is that going to help? Yes. And if I have insight to solve those problems, are you going to call me back? Definitely. Okay. So Bradley Hartman in his Sales Fundamentals Workshop has you go through this exercise and you have to leave real voicemails. And you can do this via voicemail, email, text, whatever. doesn't matter. But let's say I'm leaving you a voicemail and I say... Hey, David, my name's Tim Reed. You don't know me, but Craig Newby said we had to talk. Is I've been researching Northwest Stoves. I've noticed that there's a weak point in this product line. Now, as I've done research in the marketplace, there's a company that can actually fill this spot that dealers all over Canada have been having tremendous success with. It's not going to interrupt the other product lines that you have. It's actually going to solve this problem. And I've personally worked with reps to increase their sales by 25%. I'd love to sit down with you and talk about it. I mean, I think, I think I'm going to get a call back. Definitely. Because you're, you're, you're now you've piqued my interest. You've, you've done the referral. And, and it's like you're, you're going to add value. And, and like you said, if you can add value, don't waste, don't waste my time. And you've shown that you, you know our business. Yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing how many times we have sales reps, manufacturer reps come in and they don't even know the other products that we carry. Yeah. And, and they go, oh, I didn't realize you guys carried that. Well, it, it's on our website. It's, <laughs> you know, it, where it, it, you can go and see it. It's in our warehouse. <laughs> And they just and they don't even they, they don't even they don't even do the research or take the time, and then it's like you said it's it's disrespectful yeah that they that they don't know who we are and what what it is that we do yeah. for as a business yep you know and, and I think what it comes down to I, the the heart behind it is understand your customer everybody wants to be understood Craig you mentioned early on people love to talk about themselves man that's the truth I mean you know if we're hanging out somewhere and you and you say hey Tim tell me about your kids. Dude, how much time you got? <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. I'll tell you all about how awesome my life is. Like, I love that. You know, we all do. We love to talk about ourselves. And that's not inherently bad. Like, we have a desire to be known. There's nothing wrong with that. So push into it. But I think that 
the most valuable thing sales reps can do, schedule an appointment, do research, show that you understand my problems, and offer me solutions to solve them. If you can do that, you're going to win. Man, I, I would say live practice is such a hot button thing. Man, if a sales rep can come in and do live practice, most sales managers are afraid to do live practice. So if the rep can come in and do it for them, holy cow, you're going to win. And I know, man, you guys are both running great businesses. And and it's easy, like, you know, who am I to talk about this stuff? I'm just a, a guy in Portland. I mean, this is all contextual. It's all contextual. But as a sales rep, I'm going to quote Bradley Hartman, you are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Understand your customer's problem. And if what is coming out of your mouth is not a solution to their specific problem, zip your lip and don't say a word. If you do that, you're going to deliver tremendous value. And I think you're actually going to make a lot of friends along the way. Sounds so easy. (laughs) Stupidly easy, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, guys, this was amazing. And I want to thank you for this. I just, I love candid conversations like this. And Man, there's there is so much that we can learn. Like none of us have it figured out. We are on the journey, but thinking about our business this way is super important. And, and man, David, you inspired me asking, is there a training solution for this? And and I'm, I've thought a lot about that. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but but there might be someday. There might there might be a training solution to send a rep to to live practice and figure this out because. It's so valuable, and ultimately, it's about a win-win. Like, dealers need help. We desperately need help. You guys have medicine. The reps have medicine. There is so much value in what a rep does. But, David, to your point, things have shifted a little bit. We have to become consultants. If a rep can become my business advisor, they understand me. They're my advocate. Dude, I'm going to buy from them. So I want to thank you guys. This this conversation has been an immense blessing, and I know our audience is going to get a ton of value out of it. Well, and thanks to you, Tim. And, uh, you know, between you and Grant, um, you have raised the bar for all the outside salespeople in this industry. Mm-hmm. Just knowing what you can you know, it's not the good old days boy, <laughs> school anymore. Um, you guys have set standards. And even though I'm not out making hardly any calls anymore, I don't just pick up the phone anymore and call Grant and, hey, I got this new thing in. You want to <laughs> try this? Because I know that's not how he wants to be you know, sold to, talked to. Yeah. And same with you. So just, anyway, the industry owes you a big thanks for raising the bar. Oh, thanks, man. So, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Craig and David. I absolutely loved it. And I mentioned this last week on the podcast, but as I record these episodes, there's times where I'm in the middle of a conversation and I kind of get hit with this moment where it's like, ooh, that's going to be special. You know, we're, we're in the middle of something really cool here. And I'm not joking. I felt like that for this entire conversation. I think it's never been more relevant to think about how do we deliver value as a sales rep. That's one thing that's come up all the time on the fire time network and our speakeasy calls is you know how how do sales reps stay relevant when they're stuck at home when their dealers are closed when their dealers are so busy trying to keep their doors open they're not thinking about early buys they're not thinking about multiplier purchasing programs so i think that this conversation is really going to help that and i just applaud craig and david for coming on i think what it comes down to is if you're a sales rep and you are trying to move the needle with your customers there're really two things that you have to do and as i listen back to this as i edited it you know Almost every single time they asked me, it was kind of the same response where number one, understand your customer's problems. I mean, simple as that. If you're a sales rep, you have to start by understanding the problems that your customer has. And number two, deliver value first. So before you sell them something that's help, that helps you, make sure you're delivering value in a way that helps them. If you can understand your customer's problems and deliver value first, you're going to win. It's funny. So I mentioned this at the beginning of the episode, but if you join the Firetime Network, the cost of entry is you have to fill out a survey about the state of our industry and the state of our expo. And one of the things that's become very apparent in the responses that we've gotten back is that most retailers do not feel like manufacturers and reps understand their business. And I would say that most manufacturers and reps think they do. But from the retailer's perspective, most retailers don't. And for me, I mean, I'm just very recent 
recently removed from working day to day in retail. But I'll tell you, most of my reps didn't understand my business at all. They didn't know what I was going through. They had no clue how to solve my problems. And, you know, it was it was tough to work with a lot of them. So if you can be a rep that does that, it's going to help you a lot. And so I would say, use this downtime to do your homework. Start jumping on your dealer's websites. Follow them on social media. Talk to their salespeople. And, and you're going to learn what pain points they have. And I would say that the best thing a rep can do right now is help your dealers get through this crisis and win credibility. If you can do that, there will be such a huge payoff on the back end. But in order to do that, you have to understand their problems and deliver value first. And so with all that in mind, guys, I'm so excited that you're here. I can't believe that we are already into season four and I couldn't be more excited for it. Now, I mentioned the other week on the podcast that we have a Patreon account set up. So if you would like to support this podcast financially, you can go to patreon.com slash it's fire time and donate monthly. Now, I want to be super clear. Money is not the reason for this podcast, but money's fuel that gets us to our destination. And basically, as the time that the podcast takes is getting higher and higher, we are trying to outsource some of the responsibilities of this podcast so that we can keep the quality as high as possible. To do that requires some money. So if this podcast has been a blessing for you, you need to go to patreon.com slash it's fire time and contribute whatever you feel like is right. Now, I do want to highlight something and I'm going to do this from time to time, but I'm just amazed at the support, number one, that's, that's already been coming in. But I have to highlight Napoleon because right when this went live, Napoleon reached out and said, we believe in this. We want to support. How can we do it? And it has been awesome to see them come alongside this organically. And and like I'm not against corporate sponsorships a bit, but I want to highlight them because they're not coming in through a, a corporate sponsorship. They're they're coming in and just saying, hey, whether you talk about us or not, we believe in this podcast. We believe in its message. And I just want to affirm that that's amazing. And you guys are doing awesome things to grow and protect the industry. And uh, it's not that other companies aren't, but I was, you know, I just wanted to say thank you that it's very cool to see that. And we appreciate your contributions very much. So with that in mind, everybody, I hope you have an amazing week. We will be back here for next week's episode. I'm super excited about the guest. I don't want to spoil anything, but we have something really special for you next week. So in the meantime, stay strong. Remember, you're part of a community that wants to help you get through this. And in a high tide, all ships rise. So we need to be sharing our secrets, sharing our best practices, and helping each other win. So thank you, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to the Fire Time Podcast. To learn more, visit the website itsfiretime.com. The music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time.